put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. If the video is simply too long for you, I did record a shorter version and the link is in the description box. Star Crack, Deep Joy, Cloud Nine. Star Trek, Deep Space Nine. After half a century of occupation, Bajor is finally free of Cardassia. The it will take a while for Bajor to rebuild, and the Federation will step in, somewhat take charge, in order to ensure that it happens under the best of circumstances. They will operate via the in-orbit space station, Deep Space Nine, in order to support them, and it will be run in part by the Federation, in part by the provisional government of Bajor, which it's not something that every Bajoran citizen agrees with the provisional government. And certainly there are many Bajorans who aren't in favor of a Bajoran membership into the Federation. And in the rebuilding of Bajor, there are issues of territorialism, there are loose ends and dirty laundry to address. And at the same time, the only known stable wormhole is discovered near Bajor, allowing travel between the Alpha Quadrant, in which this is set and the Federation knows about and such, and the Gamma Quadrant, which until now was so far away that it wasn't feasible to get there and back in any kind of foreseeable realistic time frame. As such, Deep Space Nine will also serve as a space dock, a trading post, dealing with the traffic to and to from and through the wormhole. And Obviously, this raises the question of the this travel via the wormhole. Will it be a boon or a threat to Bajor? And then a few seasons into the show, let's just say tensions will increase, and what was a great show becomes an excellent one. I should say right off the bat, the this review is co-written by my ex-fiance. She is has far more knowledge about Star Trek than I, and we conferred a lot in trying to make sure to get everything said about this show. This is more subtly dealing with bigotry than the original Star Trek series from the 60s, and where the original series and The Next Generation were interventionalist in spite of the Prime Directive, this one is obstructionist in spite of the treaty between Cardassia and Bajor. There are lasting consequences, not the solution and or reset of earlier shows. This also has the most normal people and most universal stories of a Star Trek show. If you took away the uniforms, the names, the special makeup and such, this would just be a regular drama, not a science fiction show. Keeping up relations between, you know, the Kardashians with the uneasy treaty and such, 
may force the crew to do something that very much goes against their judgment. And if, if the next generation was a meal, then Deep Space Nine is a dessert. It's often rich with themes, motivations, backgrounds. Every line, look, and action will be loaded with meaning. So many different... Everyone's coming from a different place, and although many of them might agree about the overall goal, most of them, for example, want Bajor to thrive, but maybe some of them think that Bajor thriving means they don't have anything to do with Kardashian or the Federation, whereas others might think that the Federation really needs to be part of that. And it's very much... There's, there's always that conflict there. When this does mysteries, it's often not necessarily detailed, you know, explained in great detail what the ultimate solution answer is. It's more that it makes sense once you've seen the entire episode and you sort of, yeah, you, you piece it together you you think back and you excuse me you piece things together now where if the future of star trek of the original series and the next generation are you know the silver lining then deep space 9 is very much the cloud to paraphrasing character in this. It's, and it's always, always poking at this idea of the utopian future that was set up and explored in those. This has less planet visiting than the other shows, but we do meet new species as it is a space dock. And in fact, this one they, they tend to come back more. There aren't so many one-offs. It's more that the if, if you meet a new species or discover a new technology or such in this, it's likely to come back later on. And over the course of the show, you will find out a lot about it. And they, they do some really great things with that, really thoroughly develop and explore some very intelligently designed things and without ever taking away the mystery or over explaining. This challenges norms and gets into compelling themes and political and philosophical ideas and where that was always what Star Trek was doing, this one adds some moral gray to that, and an inner conflict become, becomes part of the core to further explain what I was talking about before. Half of the main cast of this have to decide between their background and culture and the Federation. The, you know, some of them are the best for the job, some of them just have to be there. Everyone comes with emotional baggage, and there are some shady characters even within the main cast. Now, the, the Kardashians are not done pestering Bajor. In fact, the, the treaty between them and Bajor and the Federation force them to work together, and the Cardassians aren't going to make it easy at all. Now, the there were times in this where I thought that I had figured out the, the, the twist of a story, and every single time, a minute or two later, the cast would also figure it out, 
and then it would go on from there. It, it keeps you guessing, and it is very tightly written. It's, it always keeps you on the edge of your seat. Now, the, this has amazing season openers and finales. I will say that the finale to the first season was it was okay. It was kind of just one more episode of the seasons, season. And on that, this the the finale of this is the best of Star Trek. I'm told it's even better than Voyager and my ex fiance, although she says that one is quite good as well. It's there is so much that happens in it, and it wraps everything up so so satisfyingly and you really see how much the characters have grown it's yeah it's it's incredibly well done and the show in general is incredibly well done now of course if you are familiar with some of Iris Stephen Burr's later work you do have 4500 good reasons <laughs> not to further examine his filmography, but I do implore you to still do so. The, this takes, much, much like The Next Generation and Voyager, this uses the first three seasons to fully find out what the characters should be like and what the overall show should be like. Now, this does become mostly a continuous arc, and you have to pay close attention and watch the episodes very close to each other, or you will get lost. The, the various relationships, whether romantic or otherwise, in this are rather well done with chemistry, incredible progression. Now, Getting into the characters, which is, of course, the core of good Star Trek. And before I get into the first one, Jadzia Dax, I will say I'm not going to get into this much detail about each of them. It's just that there's a lot with her, so bear with me. She's sweet and feminine, but she's quite tough when it's called for. She's pragmatic. She will engage anyone and finds unorthodox solutions. She's optimistic. She is what's known as a joint trill. Essentially, her species has physiology that allows for a I think it is literally referred to as a stomach work by some. Technically, it's called a symbiont, and yes, it has a symbiotic relationship with the host, and basically, this basically it has the memories of the previous hosts, and the host is responsible to enrich the life of the symbiont in order to even get a symbiont, in order to be joined, you do have to show that you will be able to give it some significant further experience, further development. As such, her, her character is established as having switched genders and, you know, several times, giving us a trans character both pre- and post-transition, and it's a rather positive portrayal of such. The, it's never, it is never seen as okay to, to claim that she tricked someone in, you know, when it comes to the, the true nature of her, her gender, her species and such, it's, it's openly discussed, and at the very most, it takes some getting used to. 
and the the age as well as the gender can thus change. It explores reincarnation, you know, different relationships, personality, and memories are all within this one being, the the Dex symbiote, and the the weight of these numerous lives, you know, changes and molds perspective. And there is the 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 joining and the symbiont in trill society. It is seen as a sort of there's there's something of a social class distinction to it. It's like moving up in social class. There it, it grants more opportunity and it's it's rare. It has something of an inheritance Yeah, there's, you know, and, and it's not, in this case, not, you know, father to son and such. It is, you you train to be a joined trill. You, it's some, you have to earn it, basically. Now, the, I suppose that more or less covers, so, excuse me, so yeah, the, Exploring also different forms of the same person, the same soul, you might say. And the commander of Deep Space Nine, Ben, met her before. But she was older, taller, gray hair, male genitalia. She it does exude masculinity and anger rather well when that is called for. Now, the... You should also note the the duty of the host is to the symbiont, and the host may be basically sacrificed in order to save the symbiont. And in part because of this, you you might almost say that the host is a slave to the symbiont, and with this. Basically, the planet Trill should not have been allowed into the Federation of Planets, nor does the species make full sense. The, the more you know about them, the more, the more you know, the more you learn about the species as the show progresses, the less the species makes sense. However, whether or not the writers realized either of these two facts, they did give us an awful lot of really compelling science fiction from it, so all is forgiven. Now, moving on to Commander Ben Sisko. He he's determined not to let Bajor fall. He is a wounded badass, but not this brooding kind of, you know, obnoxious character, you know, the, the brooding hero anti-hero that is so popular in more recent fiction. You know, he's charming, he'll smile, he'll, you know, he has a great deadpan sense of humor. And yeah, he's he's pragmatic but not jaded. I, sh I should also say the People and groups in this are all credible, realistic, and very detailed. Ben's son, Jake, is with them on the station, and he is a real teenager. He's not Wesley. He, you know, he makes mistakes. He has impulses, and yeah, they, they have a very realistic, very natural father-son relationship. They will both you know, teach or affect the other. There's, you know, the generational gap comes into it. And it's also a great example of a an African American father who who works hard to instill good values in his son without losing his bad attitude. Jake's friend Nog, a Ferengi who 
as you may know from the next generation, Ferengi are basically this capitalistic kind of profit-driven let the buyer beware species. This has much this has some positive depictions of Ferengi unlike the next generation and we certainly also we we learn a lot more about Ferengi here and there certainly are positive sides to them as well. But yes, the Nog is obviously he comes from a bit of a different culture and background than Jake and with his human values, Federation values, and the the two will influence and lead each other and the it of course raises the issue of are they a good influence or a bad influence on each other. And this is this is not just something that Ben and other Federation human people think of, this is also something that is brought up by his uncle who pretty much raises him as well, Quark, who runs the the bar and casino very creatively titled Quarks on board the space station. He's He's kind of also community leader. He's basically he is part of what make what might get people to come there or to be happy to come to Deep Space Nine. He he provides the entertainment. He runs hollow suites and the like. And yeah. The he's he's also a bit of a small time criminal. He, He's arguably the one reset of the show. The, he never really faces consequences when <laughs> some of the things he definitely should. It does, he does sometimes help out with contacts from... It's not important where he knows these people or who these people are. He can just... he can get information if it might be important and if it can't go through official channels. He has a real give and take banter relationship with the chief of security, Odo, who is, he basically has T-1000 powers. He can imitate a number of different objects and he will use this to hide out in you know, sting operations and the like. And yeah, it, it makes him quite formidable as the... Or it, it adds to him being quite formidable as the chief of security. He is determined to keep the crime rate as low as possible and he is not necessarily going to Yeah, I think I think that's all I should say about that. He is a lonely character. He is much like Spock or Data. He is the non-human observer, perspective bringer on human character. And it also seems to me, at least, that he is a that he is in part meant to be. And Asperger's, you know, Asperger's syndrome diagnosis, and this is explored immensely well with, you know, issues of adoption, belonging, you know, how does he belong, where does he belong, you know, he is he is the only known of his kind, the only known changeling. And he he really badly wants to find out where he came from, and yeah, he has a different biology than the others, and he's an Asperger's right down to needing needing daily time to 
recharge where he prefers to be alone because he's very vulnerable. Having personal experience with Asperger's, it's incredibly well explored here. Now, the Ben's second in command, Kira, who is a Bajoran and she is the liaison between the Federation and the provisional government of Bajor. She she's going to tell you what's on her mind even if it gets her in trouble. Literally, not just necessarily, you know, just passionately without realizing it'll get her in trouble. No, she's going to speak her mind even when it will get her in trouble. The She's also sort of a the the uneasy alliance between Bajor and the Federation is has a very direct sort of it's it's depicted in part in her relationship with Cisco. There is the the station's doctor, Dr. Bashir, who is young and rather arrogant, excitable. He, he wants adventure and he really wants to impress others as well. He has studied a lot, but he has not really experienced anything yet. And really only Dax has patience with him at first. He's a first-year officer, and it shows, and he is rather willing to pester people in order to keep them healthy. He is determined to keep people healthy. Now, the, and we have the Chief of Operations, and this one you may already know, Chief O'Brien, Miles O'Brien. And he's, he's the everyman. We see more of him and his wife Keiko here, and they have a bit of a Homer-Marge relationship. He's not necessarily entirely SMRT when it comes to making her happy, but he really badly wants to make her happy, and this... He's, he's a sweet guy. He really wants to make her happy, and you know what they say, it's the thought that counts, so yeah. And they have a very realistic married married couple relationship. Now, the... And he's, he's determined to make sure that Deep Space Nine runs the best it could, and he's got his work cut out for him because the Kardashians, yeah, they, yeah, the, the shape they left her in and having to make it work with Federation technology, yeah. Now, the show likes and understands all of its characters, not only the main characters, but also the more peripheral ones. And this is rather contagious. The cast are also just complete chameleons. They play the Ryans on the on their roles. Basically, like other science fiction and fantasy, characters will be taken over and such. And yeah, they do it immensely well. Both main and just major guest characters run the gamut of emotion and the various situations you might see them in. With power, disempowered, allied, you know, and in an uneasy alliance, you know, maybe fighting a friend. Yeah, it's, they get very thoroughly explored and it's very compelling. Everyone's a human being and 
many of these characters are passionate and determined about something and very dynamic characters. Everybody, you know, all of these characters, they make mistakes, they're not perfect, they do bad things sometimes, sometimes for the right reasons, sometimes not. They also have well-rounded personal lives and problems and we see it. There, there might be personal problems in some of the other, you know, in the original series and in the next generation, but in this we literally see it. And the, some of these personal problems are also ongoing. They're very much real people. Now, and multi-layered characters. When we get character background episodes, they feel natural, not as though they were written in order to convey the information that the writers wanted to convey. The crew all have varying backgrounds and personalities, points of view, and methods, and some of them you know, very much conflict with each other. And this has less of a hierarchy than the, you know, the original series and the next generation, where it was very much navy, and it was very idealized, which I can appreciate wanting to salute the, the discipline and the well-oiled machinery that the Navy and in, indeed military is or can be at its best and is most of the time in, in good. Because I'm, I'm digging a hole. I'm going to throw down the shovel. What I'm getting at is it doesn't always make for the best the most compelling fiction when they are the focus. And here, that gets... In this, they really can't depend on that being... It, it simply would not work. The Federation is not putting all of its efforts into Bajor, and several of the people involved here they might not love the situation they're in, but they are the best for the position. Like, Kira, she does not want the Federation around, but if anyone's going to be able to help the... You know, you need someone on there that understands Bajor and is passionate about Bajor, and and will work with the Federation, and yeah, she is the best person for the job. And Odo, he doesn't have any elite. He worked there when the Cardassians were running it, so that's worth noting. So was Quark. They were, they were running their establishments when the Cardassians were there, when there was Bajoran slave labor on there. And that's not something that's just swept under the rug or ignored. That that gets explored as well. And again, the Federation might want th these people gone, might want to avoid those that worked with the Cardassians as well. But Quark, again... It's good that he's there because he does attract customers. And the the better, you know, the more Quarks thrives, the more Bajor thrives, at least, you know, within a certain, you know, to a certain extent. And Odo, he's really good at keeping the crime rate down. And as he points out, Deep Space Nine is not a it's not the same as being on a Federation starship. The chain of command is looser and it is you need people who can work within these settings and again making him the best person for the job. Now the I suppose that one of the covers that 
the characters and their relationships are very much the focus here, and the and it's also worth noting that even when we're not seeing characters, they they will still grow and develop just off screen. They're still there, and it should also be noted that many episodes before season four don't lead to a lasting change. Now, the Kardashians themselves are colonialists, they're a military society, and the when the show starts, there's a shaky truce behind them and Bayor and the Federation, so right from the get-go, we have this conflict. <laughs> the in, in the pilot, the the guy who ran Deep Space Nine, Goldicott, literally comes to Cisco and tells him, I remember what it was like to be in that chair. I'd like to be there again. And with a straight face, and Ben just, with a straight face, just, there's there's a real battle of wills going on. If 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 Ben falters, if he doesn't live up to the difficult position he's been put in, it is not going to go well. They they need someone strong there to hold this, as I've already mentioned, this very... It's not a strong foundation, you might say. They, they really need a lot of effort and leadership to to hold it all together. Now, the there are among some of the more I, sh I should also say the focus is nicely evenly divided between the various characters including some of the you know some of the peripheral characters get you know an episode each that focus on them, and when and and to get back to the the main characters, they might get an episode or two that focus on just one or two of these characters, and then an episode or two later, it'll focus on other characters. No one ever feels like they're just pushed into the background. No, certainly no one in the main cast. There are there's one or two guest characters that may sometimes feel like they're a little, excuse me, pushed into the background. But yeah, it's it's highly balanced between the different characters, and in general, the show is highly balanced. Now, this does have a, a lot of lines of, you know, as a Starfleet officer, I have to say X, but... As your friend, I will have to say why. And isn't that what friends are for? To explain why. The the villains are memorable. I, I said before that the, the show likes and understands all these characters. That goes for the villains too. And I, there there is no character in this that just that you don't want to see more of. The 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 villains are delicious. I mentioned Galdukat. He's just he is so charismatic and just this presence of I mean there are times you want to punch him in the face but at the same time you want to see more and characters do get to tell him you know, tell him to shut up or the like yeah now the among some of the guest characters that are worth bringing up, there are Vedex, which are essentially priests. They lead a small church on Bajor. Vedek Win, 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 who is orthodox and very, very strict. And Vedic Baril, who is very calm and more liberal of a 
Vedic. There is Garrick, the only Cardassian still on Deep Space Nine, still anywhere near Bajor. And he, he is said to be exiled. He claims to be plain, simple Garrick, the tailor. But there might just be something more to him. Could he be a spy for the Cardassian Empire? It, it stands to reason. It might be. He's still there. The Cardassians aren't exactly these... They might want Bajor back. Yeah, he's, he's a great character. And, of course, I have to mention Morn, who is indeed an anagram of Norm. The, yes, of Cheers, the always there at the bar character. He's this cute big guy. We don't hear him speak. We don't see him move much. He gets character development through others reflecting on him or responding to something he said off screen. There's literally, you know, an episode has the camera pan onto the scene and then a character says, wow, how many siblings did you, that many, huh? And just, yeah. And it's, yeah, the, Basically, the actor gives him a lot of personality, consistent at that. It's all through the eyes and very simple gestures. Like I said, he's, he's a big guy. He doesn't move a lot. He's usually just sitting at the bar, maybe like raising and lowering a glass. So it's, it's very much the eyes and the simple gestures, and he just... There's so much going on there. It, it reminds me very much of Kevin Peter Hall, rest in peace, who played the Predator back when the Predator was the Predator in, the, in those first two movies. And yes. And yeah, it's, it's very compelling. And he's, he doesn't really have stories in the episodes. But you do sometimes see him at different places. He's not always at the bar. And it it just helps reinforce that things happen that we don't necessarily see on the show. It, it's very much a show where it, it feels real. It's not just, here are our main characters. Anything that happens, happens only to them. And if they're not around, you know... If something happens in the next generation and the main character is not there to react to it, did it really happen? It's nothing like that here. It's much more real and natural, gritty. I really don't mean to sound like I'm ragging on the next generation. That is still a good show. Now, I suppose that more or less covers the there are some great guest characters and great guest stars. Jeffrey Combs is on this a lot, and it is glorious. Some of the guest stars, my ex-fiance, when going over cast lists and such, noted without spoiling anything to me, that some of these characters she thought was in a lot more episodes than they actually were. And I think that really does speak to just how much their presence is felt and how, how important they feel to the show. Now... The this um, one major character in this is literally without hyperbole the film medium's Loki before Tom Hiddleston was Loki. 
Yes, I do mean that complex, that well acted, that memorable. This is not Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek. Some might say it's not, that it shouldn't be Star Trek, and I can certainly, I can very much see where they're coming from. There are, there are some that are not going to see this as part of, part of Star Trek. And, yeah, I, I can't necessarily argue with it. I, I will say that there are also there are also elements in it that are very much definitely Star Trek. And I should clarify, it doesn't say that it isn't Star Trek, you might say. It's, it's very much in the same canon, in the same universe, in the same continuity. It doesn't ignore, rather, it, it shows us different sides to the Star Trek that we know from the other shows. And it's not important that you remember all of the next generation in order to get into this, but it does set this up fairly nicely. It's also worth noting, Deep Space Nine is a trade post and space dock. It is not there for defense. Bajor had an advanced civilization before the occupation with art and technology, architecture. In order to solve conflicts in this, rules are bent, often, sometimes, very near their breaking point. Everything is set up and paid off on, and this is very much adult. Star Trek. There are many Philip K. Dick themes, and I lap it up. Very much of this simulation versus reality, you know, values are assigned subjectively, these kinds of things. This show is all kinds of tense. Past, present, future, you name it. The Uh, like other science fiction, fiction, science, this has this can be enjoyed on several levels. You can watch it and just take in the story, just enjoy it on that level, or you can go in for deeper analysis. And rewatching it will help you fully appreciate everything because there is there is an awful lot here. The, there, there are seven seasons to the show. They take advantage of that. They, they have a lot of time to develop a lot of character groups and themes, and they do so. The, the, this very much shows that they learn, uh, learn some lessons from making The Next Generation. This is much more tightly written and executed than that. It's also darker than the original series and The Next Generation, with some violence and blood. The revelations are well paced. We gradually learn more about big parts of the show, such as Dax's symbiont, without it overwhelming us. This favors tense episodes with a significant climax and then a short wrap-up. Again, the, the mysteries aren't necessarily explained in detail, but, yeah, the, the closer they get to the climax, the more you'll be on the edge of your seat. Now, and this goes for both small personal stories and vast galaxy-spanning ones. And like other Star Trek shows, every few you know, harder or darker episodes, this will give us a light episode that we can maybe relax with easing tension. This should not be the first Star Trek you watch, but it is well worth watching some other Star Trek for. This is this is the Star Trek that people who don't really want to get into Star Trek can watch. You just you need a basic understanding of some things. 
you know, you when you go into this, you should know what a pulse, you know, what's pulse speed versus you know the warp speed, what are phasers, how do they work, these kinds of things, you know. Otherwise, it is simply going to be too much. I mean, like other Star Trek shows, you can watch this and just pick up how the different things work by, you know, watching several episodes. You'll be able to piece it together. But unlike the other ones, this one is so tense and there's so much going on that you really don't want to be busy, again, worrying about how does the, what is the face or how does it work? when you know you're trying to also keep up with you know a very fast paced plot and again these characters that come from different backgrounds and have different goals in the situations and yeah sometimes not not every single situation and i think Yeah, and the a while into this, we get some Terminator 2 style self irony jokes to kind of ease the tension while still respecting the characters. You know, we still respect the characters after these, and the show still respects them. But it is the kind of thing where if they didn't do that, and they still went the seven seasons, it might be a little much. Now, there are interesting pairings of different characters. Excuse me. Very often in this, a throwaway line will later get a full episode. And you won't see this coming when you just hear the line. And it will flesh out what was hinted at before whilst still having mystery about it. Now... When this goes for emotion, it, it digs deep. It is determined to just really pull at your heartstrings, tear at your heartstrings. It, and it favors more universal stories over, you know, the moral dilemmas of the original series and such. It's the most openly religious, spiritual Star Trek, and it explores both sides. And of almost all ideas relating to religion and spirituality, and, yeah, just in general, it explores. Just, yeah, I, I suppose that pretty well covers it. Basically, the wormhole is to the Bajorans, it is the celestial temple. And what, what the Federation call aliens in the wormhole, the Bajorans call prophets in the celestial temple. And the they do they they will take forms of those you know to communicate with you if they communicate with you and it should be noted you can go through the wormhole without them communicating with you. It's if they want to communicate with you, they will. And the yeah they they see the world without time and without context. Now the basically they are they give spiritual guidance. They help people accept situations or grow. They they don't force rules upon people although. Some Bajorans do come up with some. The there's they they are somewhat mystical. We they they've left these 
orbs of the, you know, yeah, orbs behind that basically allow visions. And yes, and basically we, we don't know exactly how they work, just their, their powers are linked to thoughts and such. The, the prophets consider Ben their emissary, think Moses, and this is a role that is very hard to accept for him. Now, the... The, the prophets, and through the orbs, can give glimpses of your future, you know, important events and such. They, they hardly ever interfere. And the... And this is one instance of science fiction dealing with religion by saying you know, it's true, but God is an alien. Now, the, the, the faith can make people more convinced of ideas they already believe in and sometimes attempt to politely, politically realize them. And, yeah, the, the show is very fair to both sides. The... Yeah, the, the the opening credits feature a very majestic slow-paced pan around the station with a fitting theme. It's not the this more fast-paced look out, we're going exploring of the ship-based ones. It, right from the opening sequence, it it defines itself as something different from that. And it is, to quote one character, it is on the frontier still. It's just not... It's not on a ship. Now, the production design is amazing with just astonishing detail and everything credible. There are less logs than The Next Generation. In part, it's almost too detailed for them, and you can also usually pick up from what you see. There are some changes along the way, and early episodes, they're still trying to figure out what they, you know, how the characters should be, letting them find their own voice and such. And in spite of that, very little contradicts. In fact, the more you watch of the show, the more detailed the tapestry will become. And this is very much science, not techno battle. It meticulously ties up loose ends and plot threads. And there is a ton of setup and backstory for guest characters, guest groups. So when we return, we know them, and each time they return, something dramatic will happen. The show is even more relevant now, 20 years later, and unlike other Star Trek shows, this one is determined to mix up the status quo. And these changes take time, you know, and yeah, they happen very naturally. It is also the first Star Trek with a comic relief character who's sort of frequent. He's, he's not one of the main characters, but he is a frequent guest. Rom, the father of Nog. And as you may remember, I mentioned that Quark was parenting Nog. And that's because he thinks Rom is an idiot. And he tells Ram this frequently. And yeah, Ram he he messes up a lot. And 
it can at times be kind of annoying and doesn't always fit with the otherwise mature content. The this has some very distinct, you know, there there are requests that are made that are more personal and couldn't be orders, and then there are orders which might the person giving the order and the person who has to follow the order, at least one of them, maybe both of them, do not agree with the content of those orders. It's just something they have to do. The This does scenes, plots, and concepts you've seen before sometimes, but they do it so well that you really want to see their take on it. And for my money, several of the yeah, several of these scenes, plots, and concepts, Deep Space Nine did it better than any other. And I don't say that lightly. So I, I really thought that I had seen the best of, yeah. Now, some episodes of this do not have a B story, and you don't really miss it. There were times where I didn't even realize it until the end of the episode. It's usually because there's just enough material in the A story, and yet it doesn't overwhelm. Now, the when you rewatch this, and you will rewatch this, you will pick up hints. You you'll see in a different light. Because you you know where things are going, so you'll you'll see events in a different light. Now, the this is more gritty and realistic. It's a '90s show, and on the more on on whether or not this should be Star Trek, it does have the same goal. It wants to make the world a big, fluffy, happy place for, you know, yeah, man, Vulcan, even woman. And, yeah, the where this really differs in that from the original series and The Next Generation is that it says... Bajor is not there yet, and the the area around Bajor is not there yet, and it's gonna take some time. It's it's showing the you know what there what there was before the Federation utopian uh, utopianized it, and yeah, and and this one also has some some people who do very much not want to be part of the Federation and their so-called utopia. Now, the, this contrasts different people, this different characters and different relationships and priorities really well, and there were times where I really felt that if, if if you heard these characters talk to someone off screen or you saw them approach someone off screen, you wouldn't doubt for a second who they were addressing or approaching. Now, I suppose this more or less covers it, but yeah, even before the second golden age of television, this was an amazing show. And yeah, to, to sort of sum up, even if you don't really care that much about Star Trek, I mean, I like a lot of what I've seen of Star Trek, but I am not a like diehard fan of Star Trek. But this, <laughs> you gotta watch this. Just watch enough of other Star Trek. You should probably definitely at least watch some The Next Generation, since this is in the same time 
as as this. I I couldn't tell you if if Voyager is also. I suppose I think you can sort of see that's Voyager. I'm getting to that one next. But yes, this this is well worth your time and well worth doing that little bit of research of watching other Star Treks first. And communication. I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.